video I'll help you to understand chromatic aberration and the two ways that it's looked at as an axial aberration and as a lateral aberration and in this video we're going to focus on the lateral aberration. If you want to understand how axial color is calculated I recommend that you view my video on calculating axial color. Chromatic aberration along the optic axis shows up as different marginal focus points on the optic axis for different wavelengths. Lateral aberration, which is on the image plane, shows up as different image plane piercings for different chromatic content of the chief ray. As such, axial color is a marginal ray aberration, and if you put a stop in front of the lens, just an aperture, and move it around, it will not affect the axial color because the marginal ray isn't affected by that. However, if you put a stop in front of a lens, it will affect the lateral aberration, the splitting of colors on the image plane, because the chief ray is determined by the location of that stop. I'll give you some examples of that. Lateral color is usually referred to as a chief ray aberration because that's the ray we follow to find it. If you follow the chief ray through a system, it enters at the entrance pupil along the optic axis. And in the case of just a lens by itself, the entrance pupil is the front surface of the thick lens. It refracts and refracts again at the back surface and the light comes out at different directions depending on the wavelength. With a stop in front of the lens, the chief ray is redefined as this ray because it always has to be at the center of the entrance pupil. And so it pierces the thick lens at a different point. Consequently, the rays split differently. And what always happens is as you move a stop away from the front surface of the lens, the lateral color gets worse. If you want to get rid of lateral color, get rid of the stop to begin with, and then take the thickness of that lens down to nothing. The chief ray passes through the center of the lens, because there's no stop, and the lens is thin, so the rays don't appreciably separate while in the glass. They merge along the same optical path after the glass. The root cause of chromatic aberration is the dispersive nature of the glass. Optical glasses are divided into two categories, crown glass and flint glass, where the crown glasses are your lower index and lower dispersion materials, and flint glasses tend to be more dispersive. The calculation example that I will work through in this video uses NBK7, which is a crown glass, the K means it's a crown glass, and the index of refraction is a little bit different at each one of these three wavelengths, blue, yellow, and red. You now as FD and C light, and that's how I'm going to refer to these three wavelengths. Up here I refer to an Abe number. The Abe number is a measure of dispersion. It's by agreement calculated as the index at D light minus 1 divided by the difference in indices for F and C light. A less dispersive glass will have a larger Abe number because if the index is the same at F and C light, you have a very large infinite in principle Abe number. Lateral color can be described by the optical path difference of the chief ray at these different wavelengths. Specifically, F and C light are what are compared because they are at the higher end and the lower end of the visible spectrum. When red and blue light, C light and F light, emerge from the exit pupil, which I've sketched the exit pupil here as the center of the lens because I didn't show it this physical stop outside. Out of the exit pupil come these two wave fronts, slightly aberrated, meaning that they are not on top of each other. They may be propagating in slightly different directions after all of the refractions in the system. And these two wavelengths will have two different optical path lengths on their way from the middle of the exit pupil to the image plane. Different lens design software will have different names for that optical path length, and the Z-Max, it's CTR, is calculated using Y-bar, which is the height of the chief ray at the exit pupil, times Y, the height of the marginal ray at the exit pupil, times the power of the lens for D-light divided by the Abe number. If you have that difference in optical path lengths, you can combine it with the F number, two times it, to get this delta Y difference in the ray pierce heights for the red and blue light on the image plane. I put the paraxial ray trace equations and some other things into an Excel spreadsheet in order to calculate the lateral color. In this illustration, the stop is in front of the lens. That's a much simpler situation than the stop behind the lens. If you want to see what happens when you put the stop behind the lens, you can see my next video on stop shifting. So let's go into the spreadsheet so I can show you the formula that's behind each of these cells. 
Given the surface radii of the glass, curvature is just the inverse of that. The object is taken as being infinitely far away, so we're at infinite conjugates. And the reason for doing that is that the marginal ray comes in parallel to the optic axis. And then the light strikes a stop, which is 22 millimeters in front of the glass front surface, surface 2. And then there's 10 millimeters to surface 3, which is the back of the glass. So that's the thickness of the lens at the vertices. We'll talk about the 97 in a minute. The indices are just given. I looked them up and included them. Then the powers are calculated from the difference in indices times the curvature. That's done for each wavelength at the front glass. And then again for each wavelength at the back glass. The marginal ray comes at 5 millimeters above the optic axis with an angle of 0. So it arrives at the stop, still 5 millimeters above. I put a formula in there, but you really don't need it, as well as for the angle. When it hits the glass, it's still 5 millimeters above. Nothing's been done to change that. But then after the refraction, U prime is the angle relative to the horizontal. And that's calculated with the paraxial ray trace equation number 1. The ray proceeds to the back glass. Using praxial ray trace equation number two is just a straight line to the new ray pierce height at the back surface. And it emerges from the back surface with a new angle relative to the horizontal, again with praxial ray trace equation number one. The angles relative to the normal, which you may be more familiar with, can be calculated from those angles relative to the horizontal. Take the angle relative to the horizontal, add the product of marginal ray height and curvature, and you have the angle relative to the normal. Following the chief rays through, they all arrive at the stop at a height of zero, and then they proceed on to the glass front surface. They have an incoming angle, and I'm using a given. 10 degrees is the maximum field angle, and that's the angle you use to calculate lateral color. It's 0.1744 radians. When the ray exits the front glass surface, it has refracted to a new angle per praxial ray trace equation number one, and it proceeds to the back surface, strikes at a new height, and then it exits the back surface at an angle. Given this angle, 0.12875 radians, it's straightforward to calculate how high that ray is when it hits the image plane. That can be done separately for each one of these colors. So where is the image surface? Given the height of the marginal ray when it exits the back glass surface and the angle, you can calculate where it strikes the optic axis. It's just a triangle. And so that cell I15 is employed in all of these ray pierce height calculations. Take the difference between the chief ray at these two fields, and you get 0.07171 for your lateral color. Now let's keep this in mind that this is for the case of a stop 22 millimeters in front of the lens, and the lens is 10 millimeters thick, and note the radii here. And we will go into Zmax and see how it all compares. So I set up a simple lens. Here's a picture of it first. There's the part of the lens that light goes through. Here's the light coming along. I created a dummy surface where, where all the rays begin. They start at infinity though, and they refract and they end up making an image out here. So let's look at how I constructed this. The object is at infinity. I have a dummy surface, and then I put a stop 22 millimeters in front of the lens. And then let's make the lens 10 millimeters thick and the image forms 97 millimeters behind the surface. Compare that to the 97 millimeters that we calculated in Excel. What is the lateral color according to the lens design software? We got 0.07171. To find lateral color in Zmax, create a merit function. It's empty, I will just put in LACL, refresh, and I get 0.072. So compare that to 0.0717. What about the optical path difference? Minus 0 0.003724. Find that in the Seidel coefficients table. And it compares to minus 0 0.003621 CTR. Likewise, the wavefront aberration is minus 6.16 waves compared to our calculation of minus 6.33 waves. So the discrepancies between the lens design software and what I calculate in Excel 
are in the favor of the lens design software, which accounts for sag. My Excel calculations don't account for the sag of the lens surfaces. And I think that's what dominates the distinctions. I've checked the indices of refraction are the same, but that's one thing that is accounted for in the lens design software that I am not accounted for here. Lateral color influences the ray fan plots. You can look at the tangential plots. This is FD and C light. The separation of wavelengths at the origin on the ray fan plots is an indication of lateral color. You can also see lateral color by looking at the distortion plot. If you zoom in on it right at the end here, the separation of wavelengths in the distortion plot are a consequence of lateral color. And likewise, you'd see it in the spot diagrams too, where the red, green, and blue have slightly different elevations. Okay, so I've given you a little summary of how to calculate lateral color and how your numbers relate to quantities that are calculated in the lens design software. I encourage you to write your own YNU spreadsheet to do this so that you can learn how these calculations are done and it gives you a peek under the hood of the expensive lens design software which you really do need to use because this spreadsheet isn't going to optimize an optical system for you. Okay, I encourage you to take a look at the next video on stop shifting when you get a chance.